what would you say in one sentence? I've, I've been dying to ask you this question more than anyone. What would you say in one sentence is a brand? It's, first of all, because nobody says this, because brands are always described by people who are trying to improve them. It's the unit of evolutionary selection by which you can reward or punish um, good products or services or bad products or services, okay? To the extent that capitalism evolves better products and services through this unit of consumer selection, okay? That, that, that's the first, the, the, I, I think people always talk about, you know, it, yeah, yeah, it, there's a huge, you know, huge emotional attachment. Uh, you could argue it's the value paid for intangibles above and beyond that, which is what you might call quantifiable or, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a physical attributes of a product. Okay. You could say that. I think it's much more important than that. I think it's the, um, because in the Soviet Union, brands were considered unmarxist, okay? And you couldn't have branded products. The product was produced by factory number 104 in the so-and-so Oblast. And they had a, you know, a, a, a monthly target and a five-year plan or whatever it might have been. Okay? And very quickly they had a problem because quality then becomes a race to the bottom. You meet the specification as minimally as you possibly can. There's no reward for producing a good product or punishment for producing a bad one because your products are commoditized. They're all mixed in, okay? They're all mixed together. Uh, rivets, for example, from eight different factories are supplied to a shipbuilder. And when one eighth of the rivets start breaking, you don't know which factory is responsible for the faulty rivets, nor can you punish them by refusing to buy from them ever again. Because you've bought rivets from some central consolidated supply. All right. And the interesting thing there is, funnily enough, two things. One, I had a friend who actually grew up in Eastern Europe who said um, when they bought this chocolate bar, their mother instructed them to look underneath the flap. And if there was a letter B to buy it, because factory B was the best chocolate factory of the three that made this bar. The problem in the Soviet Union, if you think about it, is there's no if there's no punishment for being bad and there's no reward for being good, why would you innovate and try and make your product better? Now, OK, I'm talking about the Soviet Union here. That also applied in the UK to a very large extent to milk. OK, you had the Milk Marketing Board, which guaranteed milk farmers a certain price for the milk. And then it was sold as a commodity. Now, admittedly, you've got semi-skinned and you've got gold top and blah, 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 blah. But until the Arlers came along and until the, I suppose, Dalesford and until um, Yo and so forth came along, okay? Basically, you, so you made milk, you sold milk. It was sold as milk, as, as if it were the Soviet Union, Okay. And there was no incentive to innovate. There was no incentive to differentiate. There was no incentive to add emotional value, okay? In fact, you destroyed the emotional value of allowing people to know they were drinking Herefordshire milk, or I guess in the case of, uh, you know, Rachel's it'd be Welsh milk or whatever, because dairy products should be Welsh. It's the rule. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and, and so... Effectively, you created a market which was one a race to the bottom on price, where all, all you could do was, you know, bow down to the mercy of the supermarket buyers because the consumer had no role in the selection process. Even if consumers had said, but I want to pay more for better milk, there was no mechanism for them to do so. And you also, it also led to things like the horse meat crisis because beef was being traded not as a branded good, but as a commodity. And so once you have something traded as a commodity, just as it was for the rivet manufacturer, there's an incentive for you to take shortcuts. As long as you meet the criteria, not of the end consumer, who is the only reasonable criterion for product quality and satisfaction, but some bureaucratic intermediary, okay? You used to get apparently absurdities in the Soviet Union in that 
uh, there was an absolute epidemic in the 1950s of collapsing chandeliers. And it turned out that the factory that made chandeliers for public buildings in the Soviet Union was actually rewarded by weight, not by quantity. <laughs> <laughs> so they solved this problem by making very few chandeliers, which made about four tons each. And there was this fundamental problem, which is you'd attach them to replace the old Tsarist era chandelier, and the fucking ceiling would come down, right? <laughs> and so when you have selection, not by the end beneficiary or consumer, but you have selection by some intermediary who is second guessing the interests of the consumer. You always get a misalignment of effort, a failure to innovate, and ultimately a race to the bottom, where it becomes a price war and there's no margin left for anybody, which pretty much happened, I think, to milk producers, to be honest. Now, one of the things I said, I've said this repeatedly to the milk people, look, a lot of us are buying half our milk to make coffee, right? We've got our Nespresso machine teed up, right? I won't hear a word against Nespresso either. I know it's fashionable to, uh, to, to disparage it, but... First thing in the morning, I'm not into tamping, right? <laughs> okay. Um, now, and I said, why has nobody produced barista milk? Because the frothing qualities of milk varies enormously according to things like the amount of buttermilk present, and blah, blah, blah. Why are you not producing barista milk and selling it at a premium? But the emergence of milk brands creates value both emotional... It creates emotional value for the consumer in the short term. It creates an incentive to innovate and to differentiate uh, and to diversify in the longer term. It is both in the consumer's interest and in the manufacturer's interest because it creates a better aligned form of value creation. And so that is not an advertising answer to the question, what is a brand? But, but I make no apology for that because... The advertising answer suggests that brands are a bit of magic fairy dust you add on top of a product to add a little bit of perceived value. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that brands are entirely uh, central to the efficient operation of innovation under free market conditions. It's such an interesting, most, the most interesting answer I've probably had, Rory. And I, I know if you compare milk to, to dairy oat milk, that category, if you go down a supermarket now, there's 10, 15 brands. You've got Oatly, Rude Health, Minor Figures, all the, all in of itself are driving that innovation. I suppose if you literally have them next to each other, milk versus oat milk, you kind of see how it kind of really adds colour to your point. Um, by, the, so, by the way, it's a nice thing about Britain, which is that we're not that stingy when we buy food. You know, a large part of the US and a large part of Germany kind of buys food on price. And the great thing about Brits being snobbish mm. is someone said that, you know, American grocery retailing is all about price. British discount grocery retailing is all about brand. And there's some interesting components there, by the way. Is Waitrose posh because it sells posher things than Tesco? Or is it posher than Tesco because of the things it doesn't sell, right? Um, or, or rather, you know, so when you go to Tesco, you will probably get three feet of facings of um, what are those things called Pop-Tarts or, you know, toaster pockets or whatever, right? Waitrose might have one, okay? I'm always amused by going to Waitrose and seeing where they put the pork scratchings, which, by the way, is a gourmet food that doesn't deserve the opprobrium it receives, but let's part that. Goose scratchings, by the way, um, would be absolutely... The best food I've probably ever had was when St John, the restaurant, we were there drinking in the bar, and they just had, they'd been producing goose, and they just put a whole bowl of goose scratchings on the oh. bar. I don't think I've eaten anything better in my entire life. They were warm and fresh. Oh. Anyway, um, the, but, um, uh, but waitress, you'll always see that they're on the bottom shelf, you know. In the, slightly out of sight. They have to sell them, but they're not going to make a prominent display of them. So part of it is actually class prejudice through um, curation and merchandising. You know, there's a whole load of games going on here, I think. You know, an awful lot of what makes Waitrose posh is what they don't prominently sell rather than what they do. 